Section 11 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shelter The first immediate necessity to be relieved, of course, was food, and in some measure clothing. But close following upon it was the need of shelter, for it was plain that the thousands who lay upon the ground, on the prairie whither they had fled, in the dooryards and empty lots of the city, must have immediate protection. The exigency was imperative. The great fire at Portland, the last in this country which can in any degree be compared to that of Chicago, occurred on the 4th of July leaving the greater portion of the summer in which to prepare for winter. But we were on the verge of the most inclement season of the year, and those familiar with the great severity of our winters, and our exposed situation, between the open prairie on one side and the lake on the other, can understand how the question of shelter pressed upon us. The churches and schoolhouses were, at first, thrown open to those who had no better place of refuge. But these, of course, could be only temporary resting places. Some rude barracks were, at the outset, put up by the Citizens' Committee, which could only answer for immediate protection from the weather. But such structures, even if well built, were open to grave objections as the homes of forty or fifty thousand people in the winter. So large a number, brought into promiscuous and involuntary association, would almost certainly engender disease and promote idleness, disorder, and vice, and be dangerous to themselves and to the neighborhood in which they might be placed. Such buildings could only be put up by sufferance upon land to which the occupants could obtain no title, could have no interest in improving, and from which they would undoubtedly be removed in the spring, if not sooner, by the actual owners. To construct barracks for the houseless, therefore, was only to postpone the solution of the problem for a few months, to find us then with a large class of permanent poor still without homes, and demoralized by a winter of dependence and evil communications. A small number, under stringent police and sanitary rule, might be kept in health and comfort and order in barracks. But the system would be manifestly a bad one for so large a number of people, and particularly for the class who made much the larger proportion of those who were sufferers by the fire. These were mechanics and the better class of laboring people, thrifty, domestic, and respectable, whose skill and labor are indispensable in rebuilding the city and most of whom had accumulated enough to become the owners of their own homesteads, either as proprietors or lessees of the lots. To restore them to these homes would be to raise them at once from depression and anxiety, if not despair, to hope, renewed energy, and comparative prosperity. With all the incentives to industry left them, and with the conscious pride and independence of still living under their own roof-tree, they would thus settle for themselves, and in the best way, the question of title to land, and restore value to their real estate by proving it to be as desirable for occupation as before the fire. It was decided, therefore, to put in barracks the minimum number who could not otherwise be provided for, and to provide small but comfortable houses for the rest, much the larger proportion, who had families, and who had owned or had leases of the lots where they had previously resided. Messrs. T. M. Avery and T. W. Harvey, members of the board of directors of this society, were at once put at the head of a shelter committee, and the result of their labors is even more successful and encouraging than the most sanguine had anticipated. Isolated Houses the Bureau of the Shelter Committee is very thoroughly organized with an efficient corps of clerks and examiners, through whom the claim of the applicant goes for a careful and thorough examination, with all possible checks to detect imposition, while all are listened to with the utmost sympathy and patience. 
The houses given are of two sizes, one of twenty by sixteen feet for families of more than three persons, the other of twelve by sixteen feet for families of three only. The floor joists are of two by six inch timber, covered with a flooring of planed and matched boards. The studding is of two by four inches, covered with inch boards and battened on the outside. The inside walls are lined with thick felt paper, and each house has a double iron chimney, two paneled doors, three windows, and a partition to be put up where the occupant pleases. The establishment is completed in a simple but sufficient way for comfortable living, by the addition of a cooking stove and utensils, several chairs, a table, bedstead, bedding, and sufficient crockery for the use of the family, and the total cost of the house when thus furnished is a hundred and twenty-five dollars. The majority of those who receive the prepared material for these houses are mechanics enough to put them together for themselves, or have the means to hire builders. But for the large class of widows, infirm, or otherwise helpless persons, the house is built and put in complete readiness for the proposed tenant by the committee. There were, on Saturday the 18th inst, 5,497 of these houses put up or in process of erection, most of which are completed and occupied. The applications for them, at the same date, numbered 7,246, and it is calculated that the demand for them, which it will be prudent for the society to meet with the means at their disposal, will be about 8,000. This will provide, at the usual estimate of five to a family, and as the houses chosen are almost entirely of the larger size, respectable and comfortable homes for from thirty-five to forty thousand persons. Where the committee think that the circumstances justify it, the house and its furnishings are an outright gift. In the majority of applications this is the case. But where the committee have reason to know or to believe that the applicant has means that will become available, or that he will soon be able to command, he is requested to give an obligation to repay in one year, but without interest, three-fourths of the value advanced him. So far is this from being considered a hardship, that the applicant in most cases prefers to accept the obligation to return the money, that it may again be used to aid others who may be in need, as it frees him from being the recipient of public bounty, and allows him to retain an honorable feeling of independence. He may refund the amount before the year expires, if it shall suit his convenience. But if it shall appear, at the end of that time, upon a reinvestigation of the case, that he is evidently unable to refund it, he is simply considered by the committee as belonging to that class from which no return could be expected for bounty bestowed. The actual rental of these houses may be estimated as worth ten dollars per month, based upon what the society is paying, in many instances, for similar accommodations to keep people from being turned out of doors. This rental for six months would amount to sixty dollars, and as the cost of the shelter houses, exclusive of furniture, is nearly one hundred dollars, they will have paid by the first of May next sixty per cent of their cost. It must not be understood, however, that this is a rental charged, but only a rental estimated, and which is saved to the owner of the house in six months. In no case is any rent taken from the occupants of these houses. The stock of lumber destroyed in Chicago by the fire was not less than sixty-five millions of feet, and the supply destroyed in the lumber regions ready for shipment to this market was also immense. The price of lumber, consequently, has rapidly enhanced, and since the 26th of October has been twenty dollars per thousand. By the wise forethought and activity of the Shelter Committee, this rise in value was anticipated, and all their purchases have been made at an average price of sixteen dollars and fifty cents per thousand. They have used, thus far, nearly twenty-seven millions of feet, with this large saving in cost. THE BARRACKS 
Besides the isolated houses, there are in different sections of the city four barracks, in which are lodged one thousand families. They are mainly of the class who have not hitherto lived in houses of their own, but in rooms in tenement houses. Each family in these barracks has two separate rooms to itself, and they are furnished in precisely the same way with the isolated houses. Their occupants are undoubtedly very nearly, if not quite, as comfortable as they were before the fire, and as only one thousand two hundred and fifty people are gathered together in one community, and these are under the constant and careful supervision of medical and police superintendents, their moral and sanitary condition is unquestionably better than that which has heretofore obtained in that class. There has been among them but a single death up to the 25th of November. End of section 11